I just want to make a, a little uh, mention of muck. Uh, there were a few people on my discovery tour on Tuesday where we indeed, Wendy, visited the muck region of Orange County. So about nine of us spent most of the day mucking around in the muck of Orange County on, twos on Tuesday, where we, um, besides the fact that it is some of the most beautiful agricultural land in New York State, uh, it also suffered incredible devastation due to Irene. And we saw something that I don't think any of us have ever seen before, which is just tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of onions just strewn all over the landscape, pulled up, pulled out, in, 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 in completely overwhelmed with water. You step on it, it's squish. It was the most horrifying agricultural site I've actually ever seen. And we heard from the farmers there about what they're doing about it. So it's very interesting. So we're going to get, after the next narrative interlude, which I'm going to um, introduce to you in just a moment, we're going to get a call to action from Mitchell. And he's really working, working his way up to that. But before that, we're going to have one more narrative interlude. Um, and I'd like to invite Paul Greenberg to the stage who's here. Paul Greenberg, as I'm sure many of you know, is a James Beard award-winning author of the New York Times bestseller, Four Fish, which I started when we were trying to recruit him for this, for this day. And I promised him I would finish before the conference started, and I did. Um, great book. It, it explores the history of four fish that dominate our menus today. You know what they are. Salmon, cod, bass, and tuna. There they are. <laughs> It was picked by the New York Times, the New York, sorry, the New Yorker, and Bon Appetit is one of the best books of 2010. For me, it is one of the best books of 2011. Paul writes regularly for the New York Times and is a frequent guest and commentator on public radio, has also lectured uh, various venues, Google, United States Supreme Court, this is an amazing list, Google, United States Supreme Court, Monterey Bay Aquarium, and the Culinary Institute of America. And um, just a little personal note, I was telling Paul, I was, my father for a few years was a commercial fisherman off the south coast of Long Island and did, far, did fish for big tuna in the late 70s during an oil crisis, which was a crazy time to be a commercial fisherman as it is now. And so I really connected with Paul and the book, and I welcome you for your interlude. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I get, uh, you know, I get very strange email um, because um, <clears throat> I'm not famous. I'm I'm fish. I'm fish famous, um, which means um, the select group of people thinks that you will somehow project their fish message to the world at large. Um, this doesn't usually happen, although I rec welcome, you know, fish news. But one of the more irritating sort of emails I get periodically is I, I quite frequently get an email saying, new breakthrough in domesticating the Atlantic bluefin tuna. Great. This is great. We're going to solve this whole problem of a fish that grows to 1,500 pounds, uh, is now at anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of its historic abundance, uh, has been plundered throughout the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Mexico, where it used to be quite abundant. Somehow, some way, we're going to fix this whole problem because we're going to tame it. Um, this, to me, speaks to an essential problem uh, of fish um, in relation to the larger food system. It's funny, fish always comes as sort of the dessert to the discussion about the larger food system. Um, and, and part of the reason is because the fish system is about, you know, so people in the industry say we're 25 years behind the sort of food politics discussion on land. I would venture that we're um, 10,000 years uh, behind the food politics discussion that we're going on right now. Why? because fish are the last wild food. Um, you know, think about just the, the terminology that you use around fish to begin with. Seafood, right? Do, do we call all the food we eat from land, land food? Um, and this trans, um, th this, this applies all over the world. Um, you know, French, we say fruit de mer, um, Italian fr fr fruit de mer. Um, in Russian, you say dari moria, gifts of the sea, right? Gifts of the sea, fruit of the sea, seafood. What is this? Um, so, it is hunted food, by and large. But at the same time, vast things are changing as we speak. Um, in the last 50 years, uh, seafood has gone from 100% wild to 50% farmed. Epical. This is an epical shift, something that we have not seen in 10,000 years when we came out of the caves and started parsing, you know, this antelope, is that going to work? That cattle, is that going to work? This is where we are right now with fish. Which brings us back you know, to the bluefin tuna. Why are we even considering domesticating the Atlantic bluefin tuna? Well, a lot of it has to do 
with our relationship to abundance um, and scarcity. Um, we, as I said, the last 50 years have been really epical in our shift towards farmed seafood. And all those shifts always begin with a perception of scarcity. Um, the first two fish that I talk about in my book, um, I focus first on salmon and then on sea bass. And each of those fish suffered catastrophic collapses in the last 50 years. Atlantic salmon, um, something that used to migrate up into rivers in my home state of Connecticut uh, as recently as the um, 18th century, are now, Atlantic salmon are commercially extinct. Anytime you see Atlantic salmon in a supermarket, it is farmed. That is because all the salmon that are in the Atlantic have either been uh, fished out or the habitat that supports them has been denigrated to the point where they are no longer a viable commercial species. Um, same thing with the other fish that, um, the next fish that comes down to my list, um, the European sea bass. Now, first of all, I have to clarify, sea bass is one of those great marketing words that means absolutely nothing. Um, uh, I've counted actually eight taxonomic families out there with fish in them called sea bass. Um, and actually, the, the, my whole investigation to sea bass in the first place began when I was writing a story about Chilean sea bass for the New York Times. And I tell people, I'm doing this story about Chilean sea bass. And, I say, and people would say, oh, I know, I know that story. That's the story where they substituted in that Chilean sea bass, for, you know, that fake sea bass for the real sea bass. And, well, it's kind of true. It is actually called a Patagonian toothfish. But then I would ask my you know, interlocutor, well, well, what's the real bass? Absolute silence. Um, the fact is there is no real bass. What we've done is we've fished through successive populations of different bass. The American striped bass, profound decline in the 1980s. The California white sea bass, profound decline in the 1980s. And then this fish that I focus on in this book, the European sea bass, also goes into market decline in the 1970s and into the 80s. Um, but the European sea bass actually brings us eventually surf full circle back to the tuna uh, because, well, how did we fish through the European sea bass? Well, the European sea bass, first of all, is a fish that all of you have eaten and probably never realized that it was farmed. Who here has ever eaten a branzino, right? Or a loup de mer, right? It's all the same fish, loup de mer, branzino, um, robalo in Spanish. Um, this fish came to us in its farmed form because once upon a time, it was basically a Mediterranean fish that people ate wild. Um, and there was a very, um, fairly low demand for it because, you know, it was not a, a widely known fish. It was considered a very special fish in the Mediterranean. The Greek word for it is lavraki, which means the clever one. Um, and if, in Greek, if you want to say you, you hit the jackpot, you say you epiase lavraki, you, you, you caught a sea bass. Um, so it was this special fish. It was a holiday fish. Um, but what happened is a lot of people started going on holiday to Greece. Um, remember the colonels, uh, the military junta that dominated Greece in the 70s? Well, once they were deposed, all of a sudden Greece sort of started or organizing these great vacation tours. V dirt cheap. People came to Greece. They went to the taverna. And what did they want? They wanted the nice big whole fish on a plate. And what was that fish? A lot of times it was the lavraki, the clever one, the European sea bass. Um, what then uh, ensued was... Um, uh, more and more demand for this very special fish. And pretty soon the Mediterranean, which is an oligotrophic sea, a sea that actually contains little life because it is so clear, rivers don't flow into it. Um, the uh, native population of the European sea bass was fished out very, very quickly. Um, and then what ensued is a kind of Manhattan project to tame the European sea bass. Um, sea bass hatch out of a very small egg, which makes it very hard to manipulate. And when they hatch, they have nothing to eat. They have no yolk sac like a salmon. They have to start hunting immediately. And so uh, what happened, Israel, France, Greece, uh, Spain, England, all went towards trying to tame this fish, to try and make this very profitable fish affordable for everybody. And they succeeded. Uh, they succeeded um, first by using a tiny little organism called a rotifer, which Chinese aquaculturists were finding was clunking up their ponds, but they realized that if they skimmed it out, fed them lipids, they turned it to little vibrating ravioli that the branzino could eat and grow fat very quickly. The next feed up, once the ravioli was not enough, was another creature, which um, who here was ever um, stupid enough to order um, sea monkeys from the back of a comic book, right? So it turns out that sea monkeys are Artemia shrimp. They're from the Great Salt Lake, by and large. Um, they wouldn't, you wouldn't know about them if there weren't for, there was a Jewish neo-Nazi who promoted um, the Artemia shrimp, called it sea, monkey, sea, monkey, sea monkeys, rebranded it. But that next creature is the next thing that brings European sea bass to adulthood, and then you can eventually feed them pellets. Why is this important? Why does this lead us back to the 
full circle because it turns out that the European sea bass, along with its sort of traveling companion, the European sea bream, anybody there even eat a dorad, right, or rata? It's a farmed fish. Orata, uh, Branzino, the, the twin uh, apostles of the aquaculture apocalypse. Um, these two fish uh, are, are, they are the Rosetta Stones of aquaculture. Because once we figured out we could feed them you know, vibrating ravioli and sea monkeys, um, once we figured out their spawning technology, which is a whole story in itself and involves an Israeli guy who calls himself the Dr. Ruth of the sea. Um, <laughs> that's, all, that's all in the book. Um, once we figured all that out, it turns out these fish are the Rosetta Stone fish. We now have at our fingertips the ability to decode every single fish in the sea, which is why I get those annoying emails from people saying, new breakthrough in the domestication of the bluefin tuna. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know you can feed it vibrating raviolis. And yeah, I know you can feed it sea monkeys. And then you could maybe grow it to full size. And then you're going to have to transition to industrial feed. Well, let's look at the bluefin tuna. The bluefin tuna grows to 1,500 pounds. It is warm-blooded, can heat its body temperature 20 degrees above ambient. It swims at 40 miles an hour. To me, to my mind, you might call it a game fish, you might call it sushi, but it is not a farmed fish. In a world of 10 billion people, do we really want to start farming a fish that requires 20 pounds of wild fish feed to grow a single pound of tuna? Makes no sense. So in closing, I'd say where we really stand uh, with the future of the last wild food is there's no question in my mind that we need aquaculture. It's 50% of the world's food production right now. But we need to start looking, we need, before we build a crappy system that you guys are trying to fix, let's just build a good system to begin with. There are technologies today, aquaponics for example, that Cabbage Hill Farms in the Hudson Valley is doing, growing uh, striped bass and tilapia in conjunction with um, plants reprocessing their waste. Um, there are technologies like integrated multi-trophic aquaculture where you can grow salmon, mussels, sea cucumbers, um, uh, and red algaes all in the same place, recycling the waste and making for a sustainable long-term system. We don't need feedlots in the sea. What we need are sustainable systems that will feed us and keep the sea healthy. So thank you very much.